Yeah, come on. Hey, we are excited here at Fusion. We know the deal. Let's welcome those that are watching online. Summers Point, Maze Landing. Come on, let's put our hands together. And yeah, it is back to school weekend, superhero weekend. And uh, hasn't it been, I mean, hey, listen, if you're a first time guest, we want to apologize, like walking in, a little skew like Batman and you know, the, the list goes on, but then you turn around, you're like, can I get a picture with them? And you get a picture and uh, it's code orange. Uh, we have been loving it. Uh, so many of us rocking those uh, orange keychains. And uh, the best advice someone's given me is why they love the orange keychain. You know what it is? If I lose my keys, I can find them real quick. I'm like, okay, a little bit more than that, the values of Fusion Church. No, 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 no. If I lose them in my pocketbook, ladies, you got that orange keychain from Fusion Church. You can spot it uh, right there. So yeah, we're in the Code Orange series. Kind of let's unpack what we've been talking about here. So we said the vision of Fusion Church is to reach people that are far from Jesus, equip Christ followers, and go to all the nations. Come on, let's say that together. The vision of Fusion Church is to reach people far from Jesus, equip Christ followers, and go to all the nations. Now, so that's the vision, three things. Let's say together, reach, equip, go. One, one, two, three. Reach, equip, go. Let's do it for Maze Landing. Reach, equip, go. One more time. Reach, equip, go. So all of us should know it, like real simple. Three things, reach, equip, go. But then we say we just didn't want the vision, but we needed some values, so we called them the fusion force. So the fusion four is that we strive to have a healthy growing faith. We strive to have a healthy growing freedom, which is in a healing. We strive to have a healthy growing family and we strive to have a healthy growing finances within our lives. So really think of a chair and those four principles hold up the chair, the four beams of a building, hold it up, the four corners of a building, this list goes on and on. But, but what we've said, and really those have been around for the long last six years of Fusion Church, and kind of August is our six-year anniversary of what God's been doing in this region. But more than that, we said that, like, that's great, but that's like a vision of going into a restaurant. You know, we exist to have clean bathrooms, and then you go visit the bathrooms. You're like, the vision is on the wall, but it ain't happening down the hall. And so we've really asked ourselves here at Fusion Church, like, great that we have orange Bibles, great that we do all these things, but if it's on the wall, is it happening down the hall? And how many of us, whether it's churches or institutions, would say, hey, it's on the wall, but it's not happening down the hall? And so we came up with what we would call here as Code Orange, a set of eight values that we believe is how we can judge because we're not necessarily as Christians called to be judges, but what we can be is fruit inspectors. And so we want to be inspecting the fruit of our growing dream team here. We want to be inspecting the fruit of what God's doing in the uh, various regions around here. We want to be inspecting the fruit of myself and our pastors and our church and our team. And like, are we getting better in these eight things or are we getting worse? And so uh, three weeks ago, we came out and we said, number one is character. Like we want to believe huge character. Number two, we said is servanthood. So character is the big one and serving because Jesus came, said, I came to serve and not be served. So serving is a giant thing. I mean, there are literally 330 dream teamers that make this church happen. 333 dream teamers. Come on, let's put our hands together. Let's celebrate those incredible, I mean, it, from the parking lots to setting up a theater to the list goes on and on. And, and really during Code Orange, we've been celebrating so many of these dream team and so character, servanthood. Uh, last week we turned around and we said grit. Remember that? Grit. we got to have grit as a growing uh, church around here. We've got to have humility. That was a big one. And so we turned the corner today. And uh, the next one we want to talk about is being a, a hope dealer. So rocking the shirt. Neighborhood hope dealer over here. Okay. And that's what we're called to be as a church is really a neighborhood hope dealer. And so some of us have already said, hey, pastor, can I get the shirt? I'm like, I'm not taking the shirt off right now. But what you can do is you can go into the foyer at any location and you can pre-order this shirt 
for like next week, okay? So you can pre-order the shirt and uh, you know get, get your size so you don't have to lose out on sizes and then kind of wear this in the community and people are gonna ask a question like, what, what is that? Like, I wanna know more about this. And then you get an opportunity not to brag about the church, but brag about what Jesus has done in your life and what Jesus is doing in our community because he's doing some incredible things. We're gonna share some stories today and then we're gonna kind of come around to the end of today's time together and we're gonna talk about a love for the house. How do we have a love for for the house. So number one, hope dealer. What, what does it look like? Because listen, honestly, there are enough pain dealers. There are enough hate dealers in this world. There are enough judge dealers in this world. And whatever underscore dealer you want to give, we, we don't need to add to being those haters, those judges, those pain dealers within this world. I, I think the very reason why you and I are here today is because we want to be dealers in hope because somewhere, somehow, we found hope in Jesus Christ. And, and Fusion Church covers a broad spectrum of hope. I mean, there are some of us that are just starting the relationship with Jesus. And then there's some of us like you've been in for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And we want to be able to be both the shallow end and the deep end of the pool. And again, we every one of these eight character qualities that we're talking about, Jesus identified with what we would call code orange. But also, again, most of it is a fruit because if you've got a good root, then you will have a good fruit. So again, if we're seeing a positive increase in character, if we're seeing a positive increase in humility, if we're seeing a positive increase in servanthood and a desire to serve, but, but if we're seeing it going the other way, we wanna go, hey, time out. Let, let's have a conversation. Let's make sure you're connected in, in a circle group, a connect group, shameless plug. This is the weekend to jump into connect groups. In fact, we got free donuts. So we got superheroes, back to school and donuts because do not do life alone. So get yourself a donut and, and sign up. But, but, but there are so many other dealers in this world. And many of us, many of us have been on the side of a real dealer of addiction. But I believe there's a greater hope dealer and that is Jesus. So let's take some time and unpack what that looks like today. So the question is, what is hope? What, what, what is hope? Because we spent a number of weeks talk, talking about faith in Hebrews 11 this summer, but, but what is hope? Hope is an expectation or a belief in the fulfillment of something desired, an expectation or a belief of, of uh, the fulfillment of something desired. I, I hope to have something better. I hope to get out of this. And, and so in the culture that we live in, hope for a believer always draws itself from the promise of the Word of God. And I think that's important to understand today. Hope for a Christian or hope for a believer always draws itself from the Word of God. Like this is the foundation of what you and I will always go back to. And can I kind of put a disclaimer in here? We might not always agree with it. We might not always be happy with it. We might not like what it says sometimes. And in a, in a season of our life, we might freak out with what it says. But over time, this is always the best hope that we could ever find. Come on, someone needs to get excited about that today, okay? So again, the disclaimer is it's not always easy, okay? But at the end of the day, this is the hope that you and I need to stand upon within our life. And we can even see within the New Testament or the, the New Covenant, okay, the book of Acts is the beginning of the greatest hope. And the greatest hope in this generation that you and I live in today is the church, okay? Okay, the church today is the hope of the world. And I know some of us are sitting here listening going, hey, time out, pastor. You don't know the kind of church I grew up in. You don't know what they did to me in my church. You don't know what he did. You don't know what she did. You don't know what they did. I mean, right now in the news of, uh, of what some churches have done and some of the, 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 let's call them the pastors, but potentially a different word, okay? And, and the controversy and the, the hiding of the most despicable things and, and what the church has done over the centuries is, has not always been the most positive, but that was never the intention of Jesus, the intention of Jesus was to have a church of hope. The intention of man is always to mess things up, okay? Can, can we be honest today? Like, leave it to me, I'm gonna mess it up. And so when the church 
is left to a man or a woman, or let's just add everyone in for the sake of not like being offensive today, but we're gonna mess it up and we're gonna be selfish and we're gonna be self-destructive. And that's when a church circles the wagons and sings Kumbaya, it's dying. And right now, Fusion Church literally week after week has a list of pastors in this region that are wanting to talk to us and say, how are you doing? I mean, this week speaking to a church that has 80 members doesn't have the finances to cover the bills, has an endowment fund that they're tapping into, and they know within a few years they're gonna shut down the doors, but they don't wanna change their ways. And I'm like, you gotta change your ways. And so we've gotta be hope dealers in this community and left to ourselves. Come on, I need to say this today. Left to you and me, we will always destroy it. But when I put my foundation upon the Word, when I put my hope in Jesus, then there will always be this challenge to to be able to take next steps in our world. And so the modern world, this world that you and I, we live in, we, we've sought, okay, the desire of you and I is to put our hope in human effort and a belief in the inevitability of progress, okay? So let's use the example of iPhones, okay? Cell phones, like how many of us would say like the invention of the modern phone was somehow supposed to make our life a little bit more simple? The calendaring system was supposed to make our life simple. Social media potentially is supposed to make our life simple. All these things, self-driving cars are supposed to make our lives simple. But, but here's the reality. The reality is as we put our hope in humanity or let's say modern humanity, life has become more complex. Life has become more busy. Life has become more challenging. It's like, I can't do that, I can't do that. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so not an institution, please hear me today, not an institution, not an organization, not a political party, not a bank, not an earthly system, not an earthly person, not an earthly healthcare system, or not an earthly ideology, okay? That they've all tried to solve the problems of hope, every single one of them, and yet the only tried and true tested hope dealer is the Word of God that has stood the test of time, that has stood every system. That's, and and I've, I've, I've walked in Israel. I've seen the Babylonian system. I've seen the Roman system that was the hope of the world. And now it's derelict and dying and literally just coliseums of, of stone structures are now museums that we would walk through. And so whether it's this country or any country, I've, I've grown up in different continents and every place you would go, there's a different hope. But I need to tell you today that Jesus is the original hope dealer, okay? He is the one that gives us hope. Now, to, to the lost and to the broken and to the wounded, okay? Uh, he brings hope, but to the self-righteous and prideful and the arrogant, you know what Jesus is? He's the greatest truth dealer we ever had. So he's gonna deal hope to the broken, He's gonna deal hope to the humble. He's gonna deal hope to the servant. He's gonna deal hope to the one that's trying to grow their character. He's gonna deal hope to the one that's trying to grow their grip. But if we come out arrogant, and if we come out like we know it all, and we come out, you know, kind of armoring up, and I got this, and I'm gonna make it happen, then he's gonna deal truth over and over and over. And I love what it says in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans chapter 15, so, so, so Paul is writing to this group in Rome, because at that time, the Romans were the ones that were per, per saying that the, they're their greatest institution of the world. And in verse 12, it says, again, Isaiah, so Paul going back to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament says, again, Isaiah says, there shall come from the root of Jesse, okay, the lineage of Jesse, this is Jesus he's talking about, and he, Jesus, who arises to rule over the Gentiles. So I'll kind of explain it in a moment. In him shall the Gentiles have hope. Verse 13 says, come on, let's read together. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, I had to underline some words. So number one, the God of hope. And, and, and Paul is saying to the Christians in Rome, okay, this letter was kind of wrote, written to them, but then it kind of spread everywhere. And, and he's saying, hey guys, hey Christians living in Rome, like God loves your city too. Jesus just didn't come for you, the Jewish believer, but he came for the Gentile too. And in the Jewish system, like the Gentiles were the far from Jesus. They were the messed up. They weren't as good as the church people. And yet Paul is going, time out. 
the Roman institution is not as good as you think. At some point, it's going to implode. So whether it's this country, that country, that institution, that healthcare, that political party, that church organization, whatever it is. Listen, if your hope is in me or the name of a church or a group or a leader, I mean, at some point you're gonna be disappointed. I might die, I might mess up. But if our hope is in Jesus, we will never be disappointed. Does that make sense? So Paul is saying, hey, understand where your hope is because your hope needs to be found in the God of hope. Now, there might be some of us listening today that would go, but the God I've seen is not a God of hope. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for what you've seen. I'm sorry for what you've gone through. I'm sorry for humanity that has tainted the God of hope. Because I've seen that. And yet the God that, that I've learned about, this Jesus that I, I, I love and I study about is someone that always gives me hope. I mean, every encounter, every time I pray, every time I study the Word, even though it's difficult sometimes, every time I walk away, I have hope. I have faith inside of me. That there's a desire to be more intimate because there's something inside of me. And then it says, and as Paul says, listen, if you've got the God of hope, why are you gonna be selfish with the God of hope? Because Paul says in that scripture, you need to abound in hope. You know what the modern translation of the word abound is? Overflow. Tell your neighbor, you need to overflow. Come on, overflow. Okay, overflow. Now, how many of us, we overflow in hate or anger or impatience, you know, but, but Paul saying to the Romans, you need to have an overflow of hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I love my brother Paul because Paul always brings it back to the Holy Spirit because we can't hope unless we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And that's why being connected in a church is critical. That's why it's being connected in a connect group or a circle group is, is so critical. So to, to over, uh, abound as a neighborhood uh, hope dealer, okay, in this region, because every single one of us would say this region is desperate to have hope. I mean, every, desperate to have hope. People are desperate to be having hope within their lives. Here's the reality, is you can't give hope unless you've received hope. You, you, can't, you can't give what you don't have. And that's why Paul's saying you need to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So to be a hope dealer, I need to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That's why worship is so important. That's why connect groups. That's why serving on a team. That's why digging into soap. So we got September soap available today. So when you're leaving at any location, grab that soap. If you're new to us here at Fusion Church, soaping, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. We soap every single day. How many of us have enjoyed soaping through the book of Matthew this month? I mean, hasn't it been amazing, amazing? That was terrible. Let's try that again. Come on, hasn't it been incredible? Yeah. There we go, like two people are like, no, 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 no. Abound in hope. So you can't give hope unless you need to receive hope. Tell your neighbor, you need to receive hope. Come on, tell them, you need to receive hope. Okay, that's the very reason why we do what we do. That's the very reason why there's over 330 dream teamers that have donuts and have coffee and kids and all these things. Why? Because we want to be able to create an environment that you and I can experience hope. I can't make you get the Holy Spirit. I can't make you... Make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But what we can do is create environments, correct? We can create environments of worship. We can create environments for our teenagers on Monday nights. We can create environments. And what we see is God is blessing these environments. Now, here's the challenge, okay? So if you're writing something down, here's the challenge. We can abound or overflow in hope. But I figured in my life, when I look back at myself, you know what the biggest challenge is? Hope leaks, correct? Hope leaks, because if I'm not staying filled up in hope, there are withdrawals every single day of hope. Is that right? I mean, if we sat down right now today and said, hey, where were the withdrawals of hope in your life right now in a 24-hour period? And you could tell me of the withdrawals. And so the question I want to ask you today is what is your strategy for being filled up? So let's kind of slow down. And let's take a moment and ask ourselves, what's your strategy for being filled up with hope? Because if left to yourself, let's go back. If left to yourself, you're going to destroy yourself. If left to having hope in a political system, can I say, I don't care who you vote for, it's going to be, you know, 
trouble at the end of the day. If your hope is a uh, healthcare system, if your hope's moving to another country, I've lived in other countries. I mean, you know, people complain here about the medical system. I'm like, you ever lived in Africa? <laughs> like, you go to a, I mean, honestly, in the country of Mozambique, you go to a hospital to die. My dad was dying. He had a stomach ulcer and he was bleeding out and we needed to take him to the hospital. And he's like, do not take me to the hospital. Do not. He's like begging me, do not take. So, so, so what's your strategy to being filled up with hope? And I can tell you, if your strategy is not to be in the Word of God, if your strategy is not to be in a connect group, if your strategy is not to be on a team here at Fusion Church, if your strategy is not to be a part of our weekend services, then you are on the losing side. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's bad news. I mean, I'm the neighborhood hope dealer today. But the neighborhood hope dealer also needs to tell a little bit of truth that if you don't have a strategy, then you will leak out and you will destroy yourself at the end of the day. Psalms 33, 17 and 18, I read this this week and it had me going this whole week. Ready? Let's read it together. A horse is a false hope for victory. Stop right there. A horse is a false hope for victory. When I read that, it's like everything outside of Jesus is a false hope. Every relationship, no matter how good it is, every idea, every decision, unless it is about Jesus, it's a false hope. So a horse is a false hope for victory. It says, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear, respect, or love him, and on those, what's that word? What is it? Hope for his loving kindness. So your strategy is not to have any hope in the things of this world, but your strategy is to have the hope that is founded on the Word of God. Your strategy is to have hope that is founded on Jesus Christ, because when we are filled with that, then we can dish some out. Then when someone's complaining at work, we can go, hey, I'm a neighborhood hope dealer. How can I help you out? Someone would get that on the road home, you know? And so here it is. Can we do this today? Okay, so Maze Landing, Summers Point. I want to do this. Maze Landing, you need to help me with this. Summers Point, please, I beg you, help me with this. But I want everyone to stand right now. Everyone, every location. I know Maze Landing, comfortable seats in that theater. You're like, oh, I've got to get up. Just get up. Tell your neighbor, get up, okay? Get up. There we go. Okay, I want to commission you. Okay, I want to commission every single one of you. If you're listening online, I want to commission you as a neighborhood hope dealer, okay? Like, I, this is a spiritual thing for me because every one of us are to be commissioned that when we leave, we're not going to be perfect. I'm not looking for perfection, but I'm looking that we, we are commissioned to be neighborhood hope dealers. So Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person represented standing in any location, God, or listening to this later on at any point in time. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, as the pastor of this church, God, as the spiritual authority of this church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I commission every individual, whether they think they're good enough or not, God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, as Paul said to the church in Rome, that they would be, Lord, dealers of hope, that they would overflow in hope with the God of hope. So right now, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, I commission them in the supernatural. And as we've read in the book of Matthew, what is loosed in the supernatural is released upon this earth. And I release, Lord, each of us to be dealers of hope in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our jobs, God. And I ask this right now in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Go ahead, grab a seat. There you go. You are commissioned as a neighborhood hope dealer. So we got this guy, George, in our church. George is a neighborhood hope dealer and George has a love for the house. So let's go ahead and let's watch uh, George. And come on, at the end of that, I want you to put your hands together and clap and roll because he's an incredible guy. Go ahead and watch this. I didn't know what to expect when we were having the classes beforehand. And, you know, we were talking about Spanish. And I knew no Spanish. I was just like, I'm just going to go out and wing it, you know. I do know how to build something, you know. <laughs> that was the thing, you know. We built houses. We built two houses. And uh, then we ended up painting the third house. And, you know, and like every, like the first time we went, went down there, we did a, uh, uh, a thing at the church which was absolutely incredible, you know, we thought with all the kids and I mean, and just seeing some of our people get up and sing for their church, it was just incredible, absolutely incredible. So once you get there, you know, it, even if you can't bang a hammer, you know, we're dealing with, with kids, you know, we're dealing with, you know, they're dealing, they're dealing with kids at the same time. You don't have to be banging hammers, you don't have to, you know, have to know anything like that. Just go and just be a part of. 
Come on, I love that. That is George. Let's put our hands together. So George went on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic and uh, was building houses, but it's so much more than that. Uh, George is a hope dealer because anytime there's something that's needed around here, he shows up. Uh, he serves in our kids' check-in. And uh, the other night uh, for Imago Day, I was here and George was uh, like, I mean, he was the security guard for your ninja warrior escape artists that some of you have in this church. And he was like stopping kids and he was checking in f ladies that were coming in uh, to be a part of Imago Day. And, and then his nickname with our staff is Chicken George. And one day I was like, why do you call him Chicken George? Like, that's a little offensive, you know? And they're like, no, 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 Pastor, you don't understand. Like, he brings trays of fried chicken for the youth. I'm like, I'm in, I'm signed up. Where do I need to serve right now? So I can't confirm or deny, but one day I was in the cafe at Summers Point and I saw the chicken being grilled and I put my hand in potentially and I had to do the pastoral taste test to make sure what we were giving to our teenagers was appropriate. And so he deals, but he doesn't, he just drops off food. And he just comes and serves. And I thought, man, and he's a hope dealer to some teenagers. Because you might be going like, I don't like kids, but can you feed some hungry teenagers? You might not like children, but can you stop them from escaping because security is a big thing? You might not like people, but can you show up and bang a hammer or go on a missions trip? Because George did and his life is being changed. So to be a neighborhood hope dealer, I think we've got to come back to a place where we gather hope and that's love for the house. Because if you're just a lone ranger, you'll run out of hope. But if we come back and we are inspired on the weekends and places like Imago Day and connect groups, again, shameless plug or our team sign up, there's a get in the game card in front of our, our seat pockets or in the cup holders at Maze Landing. And get, just get on a team. Like begin to experience that hope. Begin to experience that team. And so it's God is Able weekend. This Monday, we had like our final meeting with the town. And the final meeting was so that we could get phasing on our parking lot because DOT is taking so long. So we went back to the town. And we said, listen, what can we do? And so the town and the town administration said, we'll grant you phasing. And so this Monday, we got all of our approvals to get in the building. So Tuesday night, we had our first prayer and worship service meeting at our Egg Harbor Township location. That's a victory right there. Massive, massive. Just a small group of people, 12 people gathered. And, I, and again, being a hope dealer and love for the house, Mike Chambers, our general contractor, he was like, I'm gonna have the meeting. So it can be an official meeting, a prayer and worship meeting. I said, Mike, I got something going on. And another elder said, I, he's got something going on. And Mike said, I'm, I'm gonna be there regardless. I thought, man, that's love for the house right there. That's love for the house. And so again, so many of us are sacrificing. So many of us are going above and beyond to, to invest financially in this house so that we can deal hope. Okay, that's so important to hear. When you invest financially, we're able to deal hope on a greater scale. And so our Egg Harbor Township campus will be a place where we can deal greater hope. It's not about us at the end of the day. It's all about God touching and giving hope to those that were hopeless. Here's the interesting thing, that at one point I was hopeless. At one point you were hopeless, but there were people that sacrificed so that you could do it. I wanna read two scriptures. One is in Genesis and the second is in 1 Timothy. So let's go to Genesis 28. This is in regards to love for the house. This is going all the way back. If we're talking about the Word of God as a foundation, let's go all the way back. In Genesis 28, verse 20, it says, Then Jacob made a vow, a commitment, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I can return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone, he had had an encounter with God upon this stone that he was sleeping on. The stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I underlined, you give me, of all that you give me, I will give a tenth. We call it a tithe. A tithe of our finances is a tenth, okay? So if we go back, Abraham mentioned the tithe, but Jacob mentions the sacrificial offering because of the goodness of God. But he also mentions for, for nearly one of the first times, this house of God, this love for the house. 
He had had an encounter. He, he was tired. He was on a journey. He had got a rock. He had lay down on a rock and he had had this dream. Many of us would know it as Jacob's ladder. And when he had got up the next morning, he said that the encounter with the hope dealer, the original hope dealer was so powerful that upon this place, I'm going to build God's house. Jacob, all the way back in the Old Testament, had a love for God's house. There wasn't even God's house, and yet he had a love for God's house. He said, God, listen, this is the place that I get hope. This is the place where I return safely. This is the place that is my father's household, a place of protection. This is my place that I will set up for you. And so we see all the way in the beginning, God begins to lay out a design for the house of God. Now, if we turn around and we, we all of a sudden finish the Old Testament, we kind of tick over to the New Covenant, the New Testament, we would see with the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, that, that the house, the, the building, theater, okay, school, wherever we gather to have church, synagogue is done away with, and the house of God becomes the people of God. So you and I, turn to your neighbor and say, you're the people of God. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're the people of God. You turn to the other neighbor and say, you're the body of Christ, okay? So Jesus is our head, we're the body. So the church is done away with, and there's this, this myth, there's this fallacy that we don't have to come to a building anymore. And I would say, that's good, but I've been doing this for like multiple decades now, and I love statistics, and I can track people's um, decision not to be a part of the household of God and what happens to their life. And I just simply want to say the decision you made to get to church this weekend, it's the best decision you ever made. Come on, let's put our hands together. It's the best decision you ever made because you're inspired. You're going to eat donuts and coffee. You're going to high five someone. It's back to school. You saw these teachers and these students we loved on. You're going to get in a group. You're going to sign up for a team. It's the best decision you ever made. But 1 Timothy, so again, Paul writing to Timothy, this younger man in 1 Timothy 3.15, it says, but Paul writes, but in the case that I, Paul, am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in, what does it say, in the household of God. Okay, so, so Jesus has come and gone, but Paul says the household of God is still in operation which is the church of the living God. The church is you and I. So there's two things here. We don't even have time to get into it, but there's the household of God and there's the church. You and I are the church, but the household of God is a gathering place. And so we need to have a love for the household because it says the church of the living God, not a dead God, we serve a living God. Amen, come on, someone get excited about that. The living God, that's why worship is vibrant. Don't take it down, I know you wanna take it down. I know, that's why, man, we're excited here. I never want to be a bo part of a boring church. Come on. If you fall asleep, then it's not my fault that you're falling asleep. You've got to get another nap going or something. The church of the living God. Then it says the pillar. Everybody say pillar. And support. Everybody say support of the truth. So it's the pillar and it's the support of the truth. Pillar and support of the truth. The household of God, which is the church of the living God, is the very thing that is the pillar and the support of the truth. You and I are the hope dealers and need to have a love for the house because it's a pillar. Every single time someone drives on Route 9 or down in Mays Landing or walks into a Regal Theatre and some of you are sitting in Regal Theatre today because you were going to see a movie but you came into church with some popcorn and God is moving on your life or driving up and down Black Horse Pie or seeing an A-frame sign in Hamilton or Vineland area. The biggest, why? Because we're the pillar lifting up. You and I are here to lift up. It's not brick. It's not sheetrock, okay? It's you and I lifting. And so Paul is writing to Timothy to remind him over and over and over again, hey, have a love for the house. That's why in this church, it's code orange. Like we have a love for the house. We arrive early. We leave late. We make sure this place is clean and it's secure and it's safe. And we make sure there's a prayer meeting so the presence of God can be in this place. And when you have a love for the house, you sacrifice for the house of God. It's the best investment you can ever make. Because I've realized in my life that the love for the house of God, over and over as I look back on my life, I go, man, the house of God, the house was a place of refuge for me 
in times when I was very confused. The house of God was a place of rest for me when I was very weary and wanted to give up. The house of God was a place of protection from me when I was making stupid decisions. The house of God has been a place of opportunity because I didn't wake up one morning and I was a pastor. I was a servant first. I was a janitor in the church. I was cleaning toilets late at night. I was changing light bulbs in a church. I was an intern and I was unpaid in the beginning, but it was a place of opportunity. The greatest place of opportunity is the house of God. But we've got to love the house of God. We've got to have a passion for the house of God. And I've realized this, when I don't love the house of God, I will never invest in the house of God. Can I say that real slow? Because I know I'm talking fast. If I don't love the house of God, I will never invest in the house of God. So maybe today when we're grading ourselves one terrible, 10 amazing, we've got to say, I need to increase my love for the house of God. Last scripture, it says in Genesis 28 verse 22, we did read this. It says, and this stone that I've set up as a pillar for God will be of God's house. This stone will be God's house. And all that I give, that you give to me. See, God wants to give us a hope that is overflowing. But Jacob says, I'm gonna give a percentage back. I wanna say this week, could you be giving out hope? Could you be giving out love? Could you be giving out blessing? Could you be loving on this region? But let's also love on the house of God. Come on, let's stand today. All locations, let's go into a time of prayer. Lord, right now, I pray that you would speak to us here today. Lord, I pray, God, that you would come and move in each of our hearts and each of our lives, God. Lord, that you would challenge us, God. Lord, if if we are lacking hope today, God, Lord, that you would give us some hope, Lord, that we desperately need. Lord, I pray that if we are here and we've been wounded by a church, God, Lord, that you would speak to us in a fresh and new way, God. Lord, I pray that if we would say, God, Lord, that we are on the lowest scale, I pray right now in application of worship, your Holy Spirit would come. Lord, as Paul said to the church in Rome, that the power of the Holy Spirit would fill them. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, through your power, would you come and fill us everywhere, every location. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.